I'm very happy to be able to present the result that I actually have done with Carl in last basically year. But no, in these properties of active dendrites, the, the main work is just the last year we have done it. And uh, the part of the, the, the main part of the result that I'm presenting today in the talk are already published in the, in, in I guess, August, mid August uh, issue of the PNAS. And, uh, and then at the end of the talk, I will also talk a little bit of the outlook, what I'm doing right now. On, on this project. So in the, to, to motivate the, the importance of the Danbright, I would like to, to start with the, with the kind of usual picture of pyramidal cells that actually it's, it's very long, has an epical Danbright and, and truck Danbright, soma integration across many different layers in cortex happening. And, uh, and then this is a very complex structure. And then so many people has tried to model the dendritic cables since 70s and 80s. And John Rawls has a, this amazing model of cable theory for, for understanding the dendritic integrations. And the cable theory basically is a, is a basically uh, uh, divide the dendrite to the different compartments. And that's why we have this compartmental modeling. Uh, in neuroscience and there are basically resistance and capacitance and they're linked together and all the way they go to the soma which is a soma generator spike depends on type of spike generations that you have. There is a there is an issue with this type of modeling existed and since the beginning people knew about this is that that when you inject some input or some synaptic input to that this style dendrite places that are far away, this the 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 input attenuate and the places far away they might not be as as kind of the information from far away cannot be just I'm all read by the soma. So this passive con compartment conductance based model that are somewhat biological because they just include the complexity of the cell structure and then with the structure, but they're missing a very important point that, that or posing a question for our understanding how we, uh, how we do dendritic integration. And one of the possible problem that the people were thinking about at the beginning of 2000s and and also early 2010 or something, is that the probably the voltage-gated calcium, ca voltage-gated calcium channels provide a nonlinearity that can enhance the, the input from the far away regions of the dendrites and then allows the better integrations. I would like to just take you to just very simple kind of, of slides about dendritic channel, uh, sorry, the, the, the calcium channels. And the calcium channel, there's a zoo of calcium channel existed. And in the figure A and the, first, the, the left figure A and B, you can see that the, the general structure of them, and there are many, many different type of calcium channel existed from, from a high threshold that are mostly activated by a spike. Then you have the HV, which is kind of middle range. And then you have a low, low, low threshold that actually are mostly activated by synaptic input. And also even there is not, there's another type existed that the T type, which is a transient, uh, which is not, uh, not in this figure, but, these, 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 these calcium channels, they have, have uh, provided a nonlinearity that they might be used for the problem of attenuations that I was just talking in my first slide. And typically for modeling of these, these channels, uh, people use a reductionist approach that use kind of activation variable and inactivation variables, and they would, would they combine them and make a current that actually injected to the cell or comes to the cell and it, it allows the, uh, uh, the nonlinearity. And one of the earliest studies that actually studied this idea that I just presented as a motivation is the idea by Alan Desbeck and Michel Rodolphe and Perret that in 2003, that they basically they injected in, a, in an active 
cable of a dendritic uh, tree, they injected um, different, uh, in a different location, they injected different somatic input and they made sure that they, this, this input activate the, the, the calcium and generate the calcium spike. And they saw that if you do it sequentially in a kind of right order, you can reach to the, the information can reach to the soma and can elicit a spike. It was assuring as a proof of concept that this idea that calcium nonlinearity can solve the attenuation problem in a dendrite and, and reach to the soma and generate and help the integration of the input. And although this was very interesting study, but actually opened a new questions for us. And there is a many questions existed here that I would like to list few of them. I'm not claiming that I'm solving all these problems right now, but just as a questions that, that we need to, to think about as a neuroscientist, is, uh, as a computational neuroscientist, uh, there are questions that are relevant here. For example, to what extent this result disseminate to in vivo condition, because the result that they had was in a very kind of silence type of simulation uh, study, and there's no, not much of noise uh, in that study, how the noise kind of uh, changed this result. Does the active properties influence the spike generation in vivo also uh, with having lots of noise? Does the nonlinear filter of input uh, output explain the effect? So if you just have a fixed nonlinearity that, uh, that you add it to the, to the dendritic cable and assume that this fixed nonlinearity solve your problem, of, of attenuations. And the, the questions that actually was a starting uh, question of, of this research that I had started a few years ago is that what are the spiking statistics of a network with active dendrites? This, um, this question came to my mind when I was just also talking with Carl a few years ago when we were reading the, 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 the Markham paper in 2015, which comes out of the Blue Brain project, and which is all the neuron in that simulations, they have active properties in the calcium uh, and, and calcium channels in the dendritic table, uh, trees. And, uh, and then by looking at the simulations that they have, you really don't understand deeply about what's going on. So this question remain unanswered and, and from the study from the, the, the the figures that they have, uh, we could not really answer our question, what is the spiking statistic of those networks? And, uh, and I wrote to them as well and asked for the data to see, uh, to just analyze them a little bit to see how it's difference between uh, networks without uh, dendritic uh, active properties. And so far I haven't received uh, data from the, the, the the published paper. So therefore we decided that we start our own way of building this from bottom up. And we started from just making one single dendrite to understand one single dendrite with the active, uh, with the active uh, properties, active calcium properties. And we use a very standard conductance-based dendritic model, which is, I just wrote it here, CM, membrane, capacitance, voltage, derivative of voltage, and then GL leak, and then UL, um, uh, voltage reverse potential, V and IC, which is a calcium current come to the cell and an external input. So here we assume that we have a one single dendritic range, and then we just inject uh, external noise to it. And this is motivated by external noise, motivated just governed by a, Gaussian white noise, which is a basically we assume we are we thinking about it as a as a mixture of excitatory and inhibitory that are added together, and you get the kind of, of output of this process, which is a, basically a Gaussian process and it's white noise. And and then for the calcium channels, also we use kind of. ICA, which is uh, we injected to the cell, is a GCA, which is a calcium uh, conductance, M, which is an opening, uh, uh, sorry, activation, and H, 
H is inactivation of the calcium channels. And then there are just basically multiply by calcium reverse potential and minus V. And the, the dynamics of M and H are kind of a standard in, in uh, modeling of the, the channels. They have opening and closing. And uh, each of them activation has opening, which is alpha and closing beta. And their rate of opening and rate of closing. And they have it, we normalize them by the time constant that they have, tau M and tau H. And here, when we start building up this model, we start looking at the literature uh, uh, about this tau M and tau H. And I will come back to it uh, in, a, in, a, in, in one slide that are important here. But before, before studying the system with noise, let's look at this uh, constellation that we have, this, the setup that we have, uh, how this setup react when, uh, when there is no noise. So when there is no noise, you M basically activation goes to the fixed value, we call it M bar, H goes to the H bar, and then you can calculate V bar, which is the average voltage because there's no noise. And then you can calculate it and M bar, you can calculate it also from the dynamic that I gave you, I, I wrote there. And then you get a very simple, input output relationship of this and the analytic tree. So you have mu on the X axis here, which is the input we injected. There is no sigma, sigma is zero. And then V bar, which is the kind of voltage, output voltage of that analytic place. And when you see that around some, when you increase the, uh, the when you increase the input, there is some point that there you get a little bit of acceleration, but this acceleration, it will, the channel will close afterward and it's come back and, Continue so this in, in, induces a very tiny nonlinearity. So this nonlinearity definitely is not enough for, for what we wanted to, to do. Now, before entering to analysis with noise, I would like to also draw your attention to the, the importance of the time scales here. So in the in a physiological studies, there are very different type of calcium channels existed with the different time scales and different activations, voltage and uh, and the activation voltage. But the very general properties of the calcium dynamics is that they are very slow compared to the main brain time scale. And, and this uh, slowness of these of this, uh, channels are in activation, you see that the slow about 100 of milliseconds, M variable can be 100 of millisecond. It can be around a few milliseconds to, I don't know, uh, 10 to 20 millisecond. But interestingly, in all these studies, when you look at the uh, kind of quantification of inactivations, inactivation is always very slow in those channels. So it's on, on the order of hundreds of milliseconds. So we decided that, okay, when we want to study this, first study the, uh, the separation of time scales and when the, when the channels are, are, where activations and inactivations are both very, slow. So in this case, we just take the, the limit that the tau M and tau H activations and inactivation time scale are very large. So they don't change so much by the voltage fluctuations. So this is a classical textbook slow fast analysis that we're doing. Therefore, we can, we can assume that they are in their equilibrium values, M bar and H bar that we self-consistently afterward we calculate. Therefore, we can just write a kind of a process for voltage fluctuations. So we have a voltage relative to Vt is a function of V bar, which is depends on M bar and H bar that I told you. And then there's some fluctuations uh, with, with, with some Gaussian process and it has some um, tau effective, which is around membrane time constant fluctuate, voltage fluctuates in this term. And we, here we assume that the time scale of tau M and tau H are much longer than, than this tau effective. So when you assume this and the voltage fluctuate like this, so we can go and calculate the average of M bar and H bar given, uh, given the parameter of the model self-consistently. So by, by, for doing that, the M bar will be kind of of, 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 of given by this uh, fraction of the average of alpha M, which is opening 
divided by average of alpha and plus average of beta, which is closing of the channel. And, and this averages is nothing else except the, the Gaussian integral because these uh, alphas and betas that I, I use here, they're just the Gaussian, and they're, they're exponential functions, uh, which is the simplest way that we can assume that we can uh, kind of have this uh, function. And there's a Gaussian integral over this exponential function. So this is easy to do. And you get the, the result for average of alpha m, which is important to see that the, the alpha m that I put in, it has a shift here, basically has a, has a, the alpha m will just be average of alpha m will be shifted compared to alpha m. That's, that's important to notice. And then I will plot it in the next slide here. Just look at the left figure right now, which is uh, a plotting m bar and h bar self-consistently after I just calculated uh, calculated them. And you can see that when you start from blue, blue curves are no noise, blue curves are no noise. And when I uh, start increasing the noise, they start to shift. And uh, the, the blue dash blue, which is a, a M variable, it start to shift to the left and uh, the solid line uh, blue shift to the right. And by, by this shifting falling apart, basically, if you remember from my, my equations for the calcium M times H, so you get, you get the higher and higher window current here. And interesting phenomena that is happening is that when this shift happens, the, the input output, the voltage uh, equilibrium, it start to also start to have more nonlinearity when you add more noise. And in one point, this, uh, the, the voltage input output relationship given the, the mean input to, this, to the system, it have a by, a by stability, which is the middle point here is unstable and uh, then two solution emerges. This is coming from the nonlinearity of the induced by the noise and the shift that the noise have in the average of alpha M and average of beta M and average of alpha H and average of beta H. This is a, not a tiny nonlinearity. This definitely can be used for the purpose of the intention that we had at the beginning uh, of, of the motivation part of the talk. And, and uh, so this is, a, this is for the case that the tau M and tau H are very large infinitely large. And we had this other case that the tau m can be a little bit, can be not as large as here. It can be small. And, and then we also can solve that problem when tau m is, is basically coupled basically to the main brain potential. For that one is not 100% the classical slow fast analysis like the other case simple case that we had is you need to work a little bit harder to get the, the the, the, the averages that we wanted. So for here, since the voltage will be coupled by M, it cannot be simply a Gaussian uh, function because M has nonlinearity that it, it shift the voltage distribution away from it. So, but you can still write the voltage uh, fluctuation like a Langevinian equation that has a drift and has a diffusion. And then by, by, by drift and diffusion, when you write it like that, it's a Gaussian white noise eta here. Then for this Langevinian equation, you can directly write for Kaplan equations, which is basically uh, uh, evolution equations for the, the distribution of voltage uh, in, the, in the system. And, and J is a flex, probability flex of the system. Here there is, there is no inhomogeneity, there is no boundary conditions uh, uh, needed to be particularly exercised. Everything is just simple. So this, you can solve the equilibrium of this, this, uh, this, uh, this Foucault-Planck equation, basically you just put a derivative over it or, uh, respect to the time zero and solve this and you get the equilibrium distribution for P equilibrium. And then having a voltage distribution, here is numeric, uh, you, can, you can integrate across the, the, the opening and closing variable and calculate H bar basically. And this is exactly what we have done. 
And then we do exactly the same thing as before. So when the, when the, when the M is very fast, basically it's in, instantaneous, basically, uh, M is totally coupled with the voltage. So when the voltage start increasing by, in, by, by adding uh, higher uh, current to the, to the cell, it will increase immediately, as you see in the, in the left figure, will, 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 when you increase the, the input, it will just come very quickly. And then it, when the edge tear try to close, it's an inactivation variable, the start the nonlinearity kicks in, and they will have a kind of some uh, interesting uh, interaction between them that they create some non-monotonous increase in, in the input output relationship of the, the system that you can see in the right figure that the mu, when the mu is increases and, and you get a voltage average voltage, when there's no noise, which this is the figure that we had before. And when you have a little bit of noise, you see, you see that it increases to some extent, it come back to the depth and then come back again. This is a, that's a result of, of, of uh, when you have a very fast activation. But in the biostable region, we have this, uh, when the system become biostable, uh, and we, we, we don't have the system that is actually M and H time constants are infinitely large. The, 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 this is the biostability will be perturbed by the stochastic switching between the solutions. And this is also interesting to study when the, when the biostability, when in the case of biostability, uh, when the tau M and tau H are not infinitely large, because at the end we would like to understand biology and in biology they are not infinitely large. They are large, but they are not infinite. And for, for, for motivating this research to, to understand why it's important, this question to study, we did some, some, some simple um, uh, simulations of the, the single dendrite that we have. And in the left, you can see that at, at zero, we started kicking the, the system to some value to just for 20 milliseconds, very short parse. And this is so short and so strong that the, the calcium will be activated and then you get the, the, uh, the, uh, the calcium spikes in the, when there is no noise also you get calcium spikes. And then kind of with the time constant in the system that I think is about 200 millisecond here, it will come back to the, to the baseline. And then you can see that in the, when I start increasing the noise, this, uh, the coming back to the steady state, it become less and less and less. Uh, uh, or a slower and a, sorry, a slower and a slower and a slower. And in the case of the when, when I use a sigma is equal to 1.2, you can see that it never come back to the baseline that I had before. And the reason is that when, when you have this biostability here, when you are around here, the beginning I started here and I kick it uh, strongly. So you go back up there, but this does not, oh, sorry, I apologize. It doesn't, it does not a step up there, but it just sometimes come back, sometimes due to noise. So they, they never go back and stay here. It's always some averaging between these two solutions that existed here. And of course, this result doesn't depend on this kick because, uh, because the kick, of course, is very induced, this uh, strong changes. But when you also just run the system without any kick, this black line here on the right side, it would just go to the back to the same in between solution that is actually is average across many, many trials here and, and uh, go to the average solutions between them. So this, this suggests that there is uh, this stochastic switching need to be studied and the fluctuation of, of, of M and H become very important to, 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 study, to, to study this in, interesting phenomena that we, uh, we are seeing. And for doing that, basically we need to include fluctuation of NM, NMH in the, in, the, in the calculation that we have. But the way to do that is very tricky because if you kind of write the Fokker-Planck equations for voltage, M and H, you have a three-dimensional Fokker-Planck equation and the system is already too complicated. And this, is, this kind of simplification does not really explore the separation of time scale that we have in this case, which is basically M and H are slow. So assuming, now we do one simplification here, we assume that H is very, very large, so infinitely large, but M, M is, uh, is large, but not infinite. 
So by doing, by assuming that we just have, we, we would like to write, to include fluctuation of M in the system first as a first uh, step of the system. By, by therefore the, the voltage the equation, the Langevinian equations for voltage become VT is equal to some voltage averages that depends on M as well. And then M H bar, which is a value that we need to determine self-consistently H bar plus some uh, kind of of sigma uh, V, which is a fluctuation of voltage M and H. And then you have some uh, Gaussian variable here, which has some time scale of tau effective basically. And uh, then our goal is that in a time scale that the tau M is much larger than this, this time scale of the voltage fluctuation. We can, see, we can write a, a, a kind of Langevinian equation for M just because we have the distribution of the voltage fluctuations. This is a this is a Langevinian equation. We can write a distribution of the voltage for that. So we can write a Langevinian equation for for M, which is has a drift. Call it F here. M given H bar. H bar we we're going to calculate it in a second. And S is the kind of a diffusion uh, of M fluctuation of M and H bar and the and Gaussian white noise. So basically, to to give a, a general intuition here, we do coarse grain in time, basically. We assume that one of the time scale of tau h is very, very large. So we don't care about it. This is goes to the equilibrium. And h bar, we calculate it self-consistency later. We have the time scale of fluctuation of v bar, or v, sorry, v. And we have a distribution of that. And the fluctuation of m is larger than the fluctuation, longer than the fluctuation in, in uh, in voltage, but it's still not infinity. So we, in that time scale of the uh, large fluctuation of M, we can write this Langevinian equation like Gaussian white noise. Then immediately we can write a kind of typical Foucault Planck equation for it, which is the evolution of the M uh, with the drift, uh, with, with the, with the fl probability flux of, 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 of M at time T given H bar. And this immediately give us the the equilibrium distribution for, for the M. And self-consistently we calculate H because when we have the M and the distribution of, 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 of M, we can immediately calculate averaging, uh, averaging of the, the, um, the H and find von H bar and self-consistently. And we have done that and we just put this, plot this distribution, equilibrium distribution that we have here, to, to show that the by stability that we, we have seen in the uh, in the case when separation of time and scale is are perfect, uh, this is does not really uh, impair the result that we have seen. So in this figure, you see that the m variable the, the, we a plot a distribution of m uh, for the different mean input that uh, that uh, that we inject in the in the system. So when the mean input is very small, I mean, below the biofication region, you see that the mostly the probability weights are basically has one, one single peak around zero, is not so much activated. And then you increase it, you go to this black line. And then when you, it, within the, uh, within the biofication region, then you suddenly you can see that the bimodal peak, one of them is just peak around zero, but has a very kind of of, of, of uh, slowly comes down and go back again to the to the one in the for for m. So bimodal does it does indicate the uh, the m is a bimodal distribution. Two solutions existed for this, and then when you go beyond that region, but beyond the biostable region again, the system start become linear again and go back to this some uh, one peak that is existed for the for the for the system. And, and this, is, this is interesting. And the interesting things here also to, cal to understand the, the time scale of the system. Because when we write this for Kaplan equations, we, we're talking about a, how the evolution probability of M is moving in time, given, given the parameter that we have. And, uh, and then it goes to equilibrium distribution. And I plot here the equilibrium distribution. But this Foucault-Planck dynamics, Foucault-Planck operators can talk about more 
about, about the timing scale. If you perturb this distribution, how long does it take to go to the equilibrium? And this is basically simple. Uh, you have this Fokker Planck equation in the form of kind of operator. I wrote same Fokker Planck equations before with this operator L. And this operator L has, has a zero eigenvalue. The largest eigenvalue of, of this, this operator L is zero, numerically recalculated. And this is uh, this corresponds to the equilibrium solution. So this, this goes to equilibrium solution. This is stable. And, uh, but the second largest eigenvalue of this, which is something negative, um, it, it indicates that how long the system takes to, from any kind of a state, go to the uh, uh, equilibrium distribution. And we basically numerically calculated the, 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 all the eigenvalues of the larger, 10 largest eigenvalue of the, this operator L here, and then one over that uh, largest uh, eigenvalue, the second largest eigenvalue, Will we call it? We define it as a tau relax, and tau relax is a time that the system go back to equilibrium, which is basically time scale of the system. And and in the case that uh, that the time scale of, of of tau m is 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 about hundred millisecond, for example, this example here, and with the different noise, we can see that when you start increasing the noise, actually noise increases a time scale relaxation to some peak. And after, after including, increasing the noise, although you might have a stable stability, but the noise it will just force you to quickly jump between the solution, more, adding more noise, uh, quickly force you to go away from, the, from the, each solution and it will become kind of, 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 of uh, come down the time relaxed time scale. And you can also calculate it given mu, given the mean input, and then when you, when you have a system that is tau h is very, very large, our calculations is very close to the numerical simulations because tau h is thousands uh, in, this, in the process our simulations. And the, uh, the, the black line here is the, is the um, tau, tau relax for one dimension for Kaplan. But then you see that then immediately when you see that when you go to the 200, when you tau, time scale of the second variable m, uh, H is, is rather uh, small, is two times bigger than tau m. So this, the, the one dimension for Kaplan equation is not so good anymore. But, uh, but we can calculate the second, the, include the fluctuation of H. So people who are interested, I'm not explaining this here, but people who are interested, they can, they can look at the supplement of the, the paper that we published in summer. And, uh, and then the result that we have shown, this is a, a interesting uh, phenomenon that we found. And the question this, this result posed, if this phenomenon can be also seen in a multi-compartment model with lots of channels and lots of, uh, lots of, uh, of, uh, of basically difficulties of the real cell and geometry and everything. So with this, uh, according to the review reviewer, uh, demand, we actually decided to run a kind of a detailed simulations of, of a cell, the pyramidal cells with about 1200 compartment with voltage gated calcium and potassium and uh, high threshold calcium, low threshold calciums and inject um, uh, Poisson, uh, Poisson presynaptic input like a sign into the synapses of the, of the this cell. And this, this model, the, it's, it's a very known model and many people have used it before. It originated from Acre et al. 2009 and there are different version of this model existed uh, and many people use this model. So it's a very standard model. And when we, 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 we tune this model and we start to use kind of construct models with a different mean input, and then we can see that, okay, when the mean input is below the bifurcation region, we get a single model uh, distribution, which is very close to Gaussian because not so many of these channels are getting activated. When you are in the Bystober region, you'll get exactly the second peak that we wanted to have, that's the voltage and the, the distribution of voltage. Uh, don't mix it with the other figure that I have shown that was the distribution of M, that's a distribution of voltage. And, uh, and then when you go beyond this bifurcation, the, the Bystober region, you get again back your single single peak distribution. 
So this also suggests that due to positive feedback that we have between compartment, the biostability remains. However, we didn't find the, the non-monotonicity also remains here because to understand this non-monotonicity is a negative feedback of the compartment to, to each other. And uh, when, the, when the voltage in one compartment comes down because of the noise fluctuations, the other voltages flow, uh, the other current flow to the, uh, to the dam, right? And it fills out the gap. And is, as a result, it, uh, this cannot happen, that the non-monotonicity happen in the, in the multi-compartment model, which is also interesting. And then we also played with the time scale of the system with the complicated model, with the, with the multi-compartment model that we had. And we found that, that actually the, the constraint that we have for analytical and understanding of that, that the M time scale need to be very large, doesn't need to be so large. And it and by, by, uh, doesn't need to be so large. And also the distribution of the, the voltage, uh, the, the input doesn't need to be exactly Gaussian. So we just also constructed uh, Another example that cannot be used with analytical machinery that we have, cannot be understood by analytical machinery that we have, but with a, with a low rate Poisson input with a very small number of synapses, I think 20 number of sy 20 uh, synapses and with the rate below, below three hertz. And then you can see that again, below the by a by a several region, you have a single peak distribution during or the, when the possible region are present, you get the double peak. And when you go beyond it, you also see the peak. And here we also study that how sensitive, again, is it the parameter of the tau m uh, to this parameter. And we also found out that the, uh, with a smaller tau m around main brain, uh, main brain fluctuation time scale, still you can get the biostability here numerically. So I summarize my results. Uh, uh, and then I, I show a couple of outlook that are not part of the current published paper. So we, uh, we uncover noise induced order in a simple dynamic uh, compartment. So this order depends on the noise as a variable. So you cannot really just use, use any nonlinearity that you have. The nonlinearity that you have depends on the fluctuations that, 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 that come to the system. As a result, indicating noise can be functionally important for dynamic processing. The time scale of the biostable system can be very long and allows various computations. And we show that the detailed model biostability remains and is persistent. And using numerical simulation, we show that the details of the parameter doesn't contribute much to emergence of biostability. So the emergence of biostability is rather uh, a strong phenomenon. And, and, and if you remember from the question that I posed at the beginning of the talk, I was very advocating for, for understanding the spiking mechanisms when there is an active dam rate existed. And, and here I, uh, we, we have done a study of, of autocorrelations and the spiking dynamics of the Van Buzakic soma coupled with the dam rate input. And you can see that when immediately when you start to have a more input to the cell come from the dendrite, uh, active dendrite, you can see that there is lots of burstiness of the cell immediately emerge and the, 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 the magenta uh, colors is much more bursty compared to the green one. And when you look at the autocorrelations of the, this uh, spike train of the cell, uh, average across many, many trials, and you can see that immediately when you have more input to the, to the dendrites, and in the region that we expect to have biostability, of course, the time scale is much longer. And if you, we, if, I haven't have a figure here, but if you in, inject the current to the, to the zone and to the uh, dendrite, but you're not in a biostable region, then this, this, this time scale will reduce. So it's seemingly, this has definitely changed the spiking statistics, the output of the spiking statistic of the cell. But the question that we would like to study is that, how somatic spiking can modify it by the dynamic biostability. So unfortunately, Van Buzaki, a, a um, dynamics for the soma generation spike is a bit too complicated for us to, to be able to analyze them carefully. But we can use our old friend of integrated fire neuron, which also shows exactly the same, same, um, same dynamics. So I, I plotted the autocorrelation 
also with a two compartment model active with the accurate dendrites. And when I increase the input to the, the soma, uh, the in, input to the dendrite, I can get a long time scale of the output spike. So it's uh, qualitatively is exactly the same phenomena that I have shown you in the in the in the um, in the Van Buzaki example on last slide. So this uh, this two compartment integrated fire neuron is kind of conductance space model, but we inject current uh, current as the input, somatic current, also Gaussian white noise in the soma, and then we have a dendrite. See, VD is a V voltage dendrite, voltage soma, and then here I will use a simplification instead of the uh, using the GCA times V minus uh, conductance, basically, I just use a simplification that the ICA times M times H, which is M and H exactly as, as I had before, and then we have a somehow input to the dendrite as well. And an integrated fire neuron, you need to have a resetting mechanism, which makes everything harder here, and the nonlinearity comes from here. When you reach the threshold, we set the threshold one, you need to reset the, the soma to zero, and at the same time, uh, the, you need to change the voltage in the down rate with the sum, some constant called gamma, for example, here. So basically, we sort of try to be realistic as possible, close to what, what we had in the Mbuzaki cell. So if, if we have the separation of time scale here and assume that tau m and tau h are very large, and the noise is independent for the two compartment model, sigma s and sigma d, Eta, eta s and eta d are independent, we can write the focke planck equations for this two-dimensional model, Vs and Vd. And that's evolution equations for the Vs and Vd. And uh, so have your, you have probability flux at the, at the direction Vs, somatic voltage, and the probability flux at the, at the Vd. And then you have some extra nonlinearity here that is, is about uh, the disresetting mechanisms that we have. So the, the focke planck equation gets some sort of inhomogeneity due to boundary conditions. Then when the, when the cell reach to the threshold one, one need to be reset. It's a re rate R of VD is a rate of reset uh, when you reach. And when you re reset, you need to put it back the particle in, the, in V and, uh, and then you need to increase the, the voltage in VD. So this, this nonlinearity of boundary conditions makes solving these equations very hard. And, and this is not somehow something that cannot be done very easily. Because for, for find solving these equations, we need to find some rate of, of emission rate at given VD when the probability flux reaches to one at the soma. So you need to find rho of, of when V, v S rho soma is one and VD voltage in the dendrite and T. So you need to find self-consistency something, some rate of the emission here. This is not so easy to do, but uh, uh, also in a joint work with Carl in 2019, we found a kind of a very, a very nice way to be able to solve this two-dimensional system uh, using Fredholm theory. And this paper we, we published in 2019 and not really well, well uh, kind of, 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 of uh, arrived in the society. So I just wanted to also a little bit as a teaser, I, I explained the method a little bit. So for, for doing, for solving that for applying equations with that kind of difficult boundary condition, if we forget the boundary condition, we can, it's a linear equation, then we linear PDE. And then we can solve this. And then we have a, we call it row hat, given the initial condition V, Vs, a voltage is soma prime and Vd prime uh, at the time T prime. So we can solve this. Uh, we can have a solution because at the end, everything is Gaussian and we can have a two dimensional Gaussian. We calculate the, the covariance between these two variable and ta -da, we have done that. The question is how we link this row hat with rho role, which is a problem with the boundary condition. And we, in that paper, we show that we can uh, link the row hat with row restricted problem to unrestricted problem using these Fredholm equations. This Fredholm equation is nothing else except uh, 
finding rate, rate of emission in such a way that self-consistently take the particle out when it reaches the threshold and put it back when it's uh, afterward to the reset. And this equation is exact. And, and, and if for, for people are, are interested in green function theory, it's basically it's a solution based on green fun function theory that it's this rate is a green function, is a propagator that we need to solve self-consistently uh, and, and put it back. So we, this equation is exact, and this is a Freytown equations for finding our emission rate. And we know that the emission rate is nothing else like the probability flux at, at, uh, at the somatic voltage reaches to the threshold. Uh, and, uh, and then this, we can substitute this in our equation. We get the equilibrium rate of the emission rate at the given voltage uh, at the damped right. You can also integrate it and get the emission a spiking rate as well. Ta-da, this is exactly what we want, the gain of the neuron given the somatic uh, uh, dendritic activation. So here we, we, we also assume that the, the tau h and tau m are, 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 are large and you are reached to equilibrium. So, but here we have the equilibrium distribution for Vs and Vd. And actually we don't need a distribution of Vs even because the somatic voltage can be anything. But the most important thing is the dendrite for calculus, self-consistent calculation of of, of, of VD is to, cal to, to have a distribution of the uh, dendritic voltage. And same is using exactly the same technique that I presented uh, before. You get, you can, you can get the calculated N bar and H bar. And still you can continue using this method that I introduced to calculate the, the time scale of system. And, and because we have the distribution of the the VD, and then we're having a distribution of VD and the dynamic of VD, we can have a distribution of, of VD at time T and VD at time T prime. That just allows us to time coarse grain as is, as I explained it before and write, the, write this uh, using the Freycomb equation that we have. And we can write the drift and diffusion for the fluctuation of the, um, the, the activation variable M. And then as a result, we can just write the Foucault Planck equation and calculate the tau relax. So this is a kind of a sketch of the calculation. This is what we are working on. This is outlook. And, but I wanted to illustrate it a little bit in detail how it really uh, can, we can do it. Now I would like to end my talk by, by kind of a starting point of this research in 2017 when I was just asking the questions of what are the network phenomena can emerge when I have the, when I have the dendritic uh, active properties. So here you can see it in the first figure, the first figure on the left on the top, I have one single cell and this one is an uh, injected current uh, and uh, it's a Van Buzaki cell. Then I, I um, that has a, has a dendrite and, uh, and the most of the input comes through the dendrite. And then I hear, uh, I turn off and on, on calcium, calcium uh, active properties. And you can see that this is what the result that I've shown before. You can see that the burstiness emerges. And when I do this in, this, in a network of, of balanced network of many, many cells, you can see that there is a network width with active properties has shown much more longer time scale than the network without. And I also plotted the, 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 the spike histogram, uh, the spike, uh, um, the spiking patterns of the network with, the, with active properties of the Android and without. And you can see that the burstiness and time scales is much more present there. And it's unclear right now that is the, the, the uh, the, the time scales that you can see from this network is exactly the same as time scale that you can see from the single cell properties. So this pose a question that I would like to, to kind of open question to me. I, I personally don't know how to solve it, but I personally think it's a very important question to, 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 to tackle. How do we do self-consistent calculations with the slow input? Because here the input is fluctuates in the time scale of the order of of time scale of fluctuation of single cell. So we cannot use a separation of time scales technique that I have presented. 
And by, by, by posing this open question, I would like to thank my collaborator, which is Carl, uh, on this, uh, on this uh, project. And also people that gave a comment uh, on, the, on the manuscript and also supporting me in this, uh, in this, uh, in this uh, work project. Uh, Matthew Larkham read our manuscript and made comment and also uh, we are in a, in a kind of collaboration to, to test this TS theory experimentally. Robert Gower is a postdoc in the lab that actually also have a lot of conversation about the work and, and calculations. And Sonia uh, and Susanne Schreiber uh, is my host in Berlin and she's very supporting me. And most of the work is kind of financed by DFK. Thank you everybody for the attention and I stop here.